Today, on Pat's Car Garage, I want to do something a little bit different. There are about a billion videos on YouTube about rebuilding a Dana 30. The problem with those videos is usually the following. They're all made by experts that have been rebuilding axles since they were in the third grade. What if you're a complete noob such as myself? It's great to learn from professionals that know what they are doing, but don't underestimate the value of learning from a beginner's own mistakes. So this is what this video series will be about, my own screw-ups. Hopefully, you can learn something with me as you come along for the ride. You just saw me pull the knuckle off and remove the top ball joint. When replacing ball joints on an old axle, which may already have had its ball joints replaced in the past, always get one of those splined ball joints. You will see why shortly on the bottom ball joint. Ball joint replacement toolkits sometimes come with a tapered collar for installation, which is recommended for Dana axles. You don't need one, and my kit didn't come with one, so just make sure you start the ball joint in squarely. I tapped mine in a little bit with a hammer, and when I used the clamp, I made sure it was tilted in such a way it drove the ball joint in straight. Now we hit our first snag. A brand new Dana Spicer ball joint does not fit the bottom hole. The joint is too small. This happens after the ball joints have been replaced a few times. They stretch out the hole until a new one no longer fits. The solution is to get a splined ball joint. They are typically oversized, so they will fit snugly in a worn out hole. We'll come back to the lower ball joints after I do a parts run. I end up using some Moog problem solver ball joints. The neat thing is that they are also greasable, so with regular maintenance, in theory, I'll never need to replace them. As I struggle with this lower ball joint, let me give you the backstory on this axle. I wanted to rebuild both my Jeep's axles, but I wanted to have my Jeep working while I did it. This means I needed a second set of axles. Luckily, I struck gold in the junkyard and found this Dana 30 and a matching Dana 35 for the rear. They are 373 gears, as opposed to my 355s, and the rear is limited slip, as opposed to my current open rear differential. This is perfect. I can take my time to rebuild the axles and have a decent upgrade at the same time. If you are struggling to get the top ball joint lined up, you can get a couple of washers to shim the collar. This is where the tapered collar would have helped, but again, it's not really necessary. Now is also the perfect time to replace the upper control arm bushings. Way back when I did my front suspension, you may remember I haven't done this since I ran out of time. Worn out upper control arm bushings are what cause death wobble on the Dana 30. Luckily, I never got to that point. But still, it's a good time to fit new ones. So, for some reason, uh, my camera didn't film that, but take a big wrench and jam it in here, and then use the C-clamp to push it through. When removing the bushings, I suggest you start by pressing the outer surface of the bushing first, just to get it moving. Once your cup bottoms out, you can drive it out with a screw only. Putting new ones in is a little annoying. They want to go in crooked. I just plowed mine in. It does damage the outer metal cup a little bit, but the bushing remains intact, so it'll work just fine. A lot of people will say, oh, just swap in junkyard axles. Yeah, don't do that, guys. You saw how nasty the gear oil that came out of there was. It was also full of dirt and grit. A simple swap like that would have destroyed the bearings and gears. This axle housing will need a proper cleaning on the inside. So of course my carrier was stuck, uh, but I did come up with a contraption to get it out. So you can pry on like, like between like either the casing or that and like one of these ribs. But of course you need to stop the uh, carrier from rotating. So just jam a breaker bar in your pinion through the yoke and there you go. Then you can pry on this all you want without it just simply spinning. And then that will allow you to pull the uh, carrier out. For some reason, my camera stopped recording when I took the pinion out. Basically, you want to leave the nut on a few threads, just to catch the pinion when it falls out. Pound the pinion out with a hammer, remove the nut once the pinion is loose, and then you can remove the pinion by hand without it falling out of the housing. To remove the carrier bearings without a hydraulic press, here's what you can do. I ended up doing all of the following methods. You can snip the cage off, then you can cut through the inner race with a Dremel. I started off by trying with an angle grinder, but it's way too big for that. I did end up having to redo it because the bearings in my rebuild kit contained an incorrect bearing, so I also bought a cheap bearing removal tool. The tool worked reasonably well on the carrier bearings, but it didn't work at all for the pinion bearing, so the pinion bearing will still need to be cut off. 
When you remove the bearings, make sure to keep track of the shims that came out too and the side which they came from. This is important because we need to put the same shims back into the same spot to keep the correct gear pattern. By the time I got to the pinion bearing, I wised up and realized this is a job for a Dremel, not a grinder. It's way easier to control and there's less risk of cutting too deep, or cutting the wrong thing. The big oil ring you see on the pinion is also the pinion depth shim. When you cut the bearing race off, keep in mind that the bearing gets thicker the closer you get to the gear because of its taper. The shaft is straight, it's the bearing that's tapered. Knowing this, you can save yourself a lot of chiseling. Start at the top of the bearing and work your way down, keeping the distance to the shaft the same. This means your cut will be deeper as you cut through the bearing. If there is even a thin sliver of bearing left, it will crack easily when you hit it with a hammer and chisel. So start with a less deep cut, and if you aren't sure how deep to go, you can always cut a little bit more. Then, it should pop off fairly easily with a hammer and chisel. If you live in the rusty, crusty salt belt, the pinion seal will put up a fight. Just keep hammering it until you can get enough of a lip on it to pop it out. Now we can pound out the bearing races. I just use the hammer and chisel. Be careful not to whack the housing, otherwise some mild taps will get the races out. We can also pound out the seals. I just rammed the axle shafts into the seals until they came out. Okay, time to clean it out. Uh, brake clean, compressed air, make sure it's nice and clean before putting anything back in it. After dumping two cans of brake clean into the housing, it's now ready for reassembly. You need a bearing race driver kit for this next part. Basically, it's these aluminum drivers you can tap with a hammer to see bearing races without damaging them. The ones I bought happened not to fit, at least not the tapered side. If I flip them around to the flat side, they fit just fine, so it's not the end of the world. Slowly tap the new races in. You'll hear the sound change when they bottom out, you'll also feel it in the hammer. Important! Don't forget to put the rear pinion bearing in before installing the pinion seal. Now I'm putting in the pinion seal. I used a block of wood to get it started, but then, when it's near the bottom, I finish it off with a hammer. Now for some knowledge you really came here for. The hardest part of this rebuild was putting in new axle seals. I really recommend you buy four seals, since they're so cheap and you'll probably break at least one of them if this is your first time doing this. I did manage to put one side in really easily by heating the axle tube with a heat gun and chilling the seal in the freezer. Plug the other end of the axle tube so that the heat doesn't escape from it. Duh. Yes, dude! <laughs> oh, man. Unfortunately, I wasn't so lucky on the other side. I needed to pound that last seal in. I used an old anti-roll bar as a super long extension, but you probably could combine a bunch of ratchet extensions. It helps to have another set of hands on this. One person holding the rod straight, and another one hammering. I did it alone, so it's definitely possible, but yeah, it took me way too long to do this. This feels like a design flaw. So if you're having trouble putting the uh, wheel seals in into a Dana 30, uh, here's my advice. So the, they, they come with these little um, springs that go around the seal. Take those off first, then pound the seal in. Uh, so I used a 35 millimeter socket, which fits nicely like on the inside of the seal. Uh, pound it in all the way and then reinstall the spring because what happens is the inside of a socket can easily deform the spring and then you, you're not going to have a good seal but these seals they come right out just obviously don't forget to uh, put them back in afterwards. No press, no problem. Put your bearings in the oven for 30 minutes at 150 celsius, leave your carrier and pinion in the freezer for a few hours, stack the correct shims on the correct side and boom. To be fair, this doesn't always work, as evidenced by this other side. If it doesn't, you can hammer the bearings on with a socket. Just hammer on the inside race of the bearing so you don't damage it. We'll put that aside for now. 
I didn't feel myself hammering it on, but you know, tappy tap tap and we're good. It's good to hammer the bearings a few times anyway, just to make sure they are seated all the way down. Let's do the same trick on the pinion. The bearing didn't seat fully since I could still move the oil shim, so I used a hammer and chisel to tap the bearing down all the way, gently tapping all around the perimeter of the inner race. You can use a brass punch if it makes you feel better, but chisels aren't hardened like bearing graces, so a steel chisel won't damage it. We're back on ball joint duty. These splined ball joints fit the worn out hole properly. I'll also reinstall the knuckle on this side, and I'll post the torque specs in the description below. The other side's knuckle was cracked on this axle, so I'll replace it with the knuckle currently on my Jeep. Don't forget to put new cotter pins. Put the grease fittings on and pump the joints with grease until the boot becomes hard. Now it's time to put in the pinion gear. Put a little bit of gear oil on the rear bearing before you put the pinion in. You wouldn't want that bearing to be starved of oil the first time you drive out. Fit a new crush sleeve on the pinion shaft and make sure it drops all the way down to the front pinion bearing. If you put it on the wrong way, it won't seat all the way down. Now put the pinion into the housing, put the yoke on and start tightening it with the old pinion nut. You'll see me use an impact gun, but you should be really careful with that as you can easily over tighten the pinion nut. Only use the impact to take the slop out of the pinion. As soon as the slop is gone, remove the old pinion nut and put the new one on instead. You need to do the final tightening by hand. You will need an inch pound torque wrench to correctly set the pinion preload. As soon as you feel some resistance, measure it and tighten the pinion nut in small increments. I had a brief scare, not knowing how much 20 inch pounds felt like. It feels a lot tougher than you'd expect. I've heard it described as a doorknob, but no. 20 inch pounds is way more than a doorknob. I don't know what kind of doorknobs those people have. Maybe it's some new form of gym equipment to strengthen your wrists. Oh, you know what? That might, oh. That might actually be good here, guys. That's still below 20 inch pounds. I think I was saved by the bell. inch pounds. A little high, but I think it'll be all right. You've got to be careful because it goes quick. The final part is to put the carrier back in. You'll need a dead blow hammer for this part. Basically, you need to persuade the carrier back in. Don't start reefing on it, but it will need a lot of decent blows. I won't be checking the gear pattern for a few reasons. First of all, we're putting the old gears back in since they were fine. We just put in new bearings and seals. Since we put back all the shims back in the same spot we took them from, in theory everything will line up just fine. Secondly, the rebuild kit came with a manual, and the manual said not to bother checking for a gear pattern if putting in old gears. I'm paraphrasing, but it basically said it is what it is. And lastly, the shims being behind the bearings, do you really want to pull them back off to set the gears up? I didn't think so. I'm happy to report that at the time of writing this script, I've driven about 4,000 kilometers and everything is fine. And if one day it blows up, low pinion Dana 30s with 373 gears or a dime a dozen at a junkyard. I can always do this again and do it better. So just avoid suffering from analysis paralysis. They say you need to put the caps back on in the same location and orientation you took them from. Not really sure why since the bearing race doesn't rotate in the bearing cap but I won't argue with this, so just do as is recommended. As usual, thanks for watching, I hope you've learned something new, and do be on the lookout for the rear Dana 35 rebuild, which I'll be posting in about a month.